So unfortunately, um, he passed away a couple years ago. Um, you can actually listen to her, the interview I did with him on upper airway resistance syndrome on my podcast. I actually asked him, because there's a running joke that um, he chose 10 seconds because he coined the term sleep apnea. There's a running joke that he chose 10 seconds because he had 10 fingers. <laughs> um, but so I asked him on that, about this issue, and he said it's because around 10 seconds is when you start to see negative physiologic changes, which makes sense. All right. So typically, people with these um, symptoms with URS are typically younger, more female, like 65, 35. Um, they're relatively normal weight or low weight. They have low blood pressure. They get dizzy and lightheaded when they stand up really quickly. Co maybe have cold hands or feet, headaches, um, anxiety issues, depression, irritable bowel syndrome or various gastrointestinal problems, TMJ. Um, insomnia, hypothyroidism, like these somatic syndromes. Preeclampsia has been shown to exist in preeclamptic women. Uh, there was actually a study looking at applying CPAP in preeclamptic women and it lowered the blood pressure and they had better fetal movements. But it has, hasn't been applied in clinical practice. Uh, Alpha-delta sleep, which is when you have fast brain waves intruding into slow, um, deep sleep. That happens quite often. Limb movements as well and joint pain, muscle pain, those kind of things, and migraines. I'm willing to bet that many of you have some or many of these symptoms in this room. All right. So if you go to a doctor with all these symptoms and you ask them, what can I do? What can you do for me? This is probably the answer that you're going to get, right? I don't know. <laughs> so what are some of the steps that you can take to see whether or not you have sleep apnea? So what kind of tests can you do? And like what the previous speaker said, the test doesn't really show anything. If anything, what I look for in a test, if you don't have sleep apnea, is you're going to look for lots of arousals, like, like a lot of sleep fragmentation. Uh, lots of arousals, and they're tossing and turning a lot. Or they have very limited periods of deep sleep or REM sleep. Okay? But usually the sleep test is not really diagnostic for this condition. Ultimately, URIRS is a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning that if you fit the clinical history and you have good examination, um, that's your diagnosis. It's a presumptive diagnosis. However, you do have certain indirect ways of measuring this, and like what was talked about, um, the cardio pulmonary coupling, um, very high resolution pox oximetry machines. It measures heart rate changes. Um, and they're, they're very good tools to measure um, sleep dysfunction. But officially, they're not recommended by the sleep societies for a diagnosis. But they're very useful tools for pre- and post-treatment improvement. So like I said, the most important way of diagnosing this is by history and the physical exam. Now, when you look inside someone's mouth, this is a caricature of a big mouth. Unfortunately, you never see this picture with modern humans anymore. What you see is that the jaws are narrow, you have a high arch palate, the tongue, because the mouth is small, the tongue sits really high. So you have to press the tongue depressor down really hardly to see the back of the throat and they gag, right? And then oftentimes you see ankle gossip or tongue tie, which has been covered before. Um, I, I have to say that I am a true believer in ad addressing these issues. Um, early in my career, somehow a woman, a, mother, a new mother came to see me because she couldn't breastfeed. She, uh, her son wasn't latching on. It was only like 10 days after he was born. And so he had a severe tongue tie. And back then, I just clicked it like the old traditionalist with the scissors and then just kind of pushed on it. He was crying like crazy, but she started breastfeeding him. He was, just, he was feeding perfectly, and he stopped crying. So it's just one anecdote, but that's why I'm a believer. <laughs> okay. And then with the advent of fiber optic instruments that just opened up this whole new world for us doctors in general, not just us, but other fields as well. I'm going to show you what I see in the office on a awake patient. It's, just, it's, just, it's a very general ENT examination if I put the camera in. I'll describe the structures that I see as I'm going down. Okay. It's a nasal endoscopy. So this is a decongested nose with afferent septum is right here. You see the deviated septum over here. The turbinate is the very, like the middle turbinate here. Okay. And this is the other side, the turbinate on the left side, septum here. And we're going to go to the back of the nose. This is where the adenoids would be if it's very large. The eustachian tubes are to the right and left. Then you go down behind the soft palate. This is the tongue base, epiglottis, very narrow already, sitting up. We'll take a look at the voice box. Oh, I'm going to do a Muller's maneuver where I have them sniff in with a closed nose to see what happens when they 
negative pressure. Okay. And then we're going to take a look at the voice box to see if there's any swelling with the vocal cords signifying reflux. And most people have a lot of swelling in the back of the voice box with the reflux. And then we're going to have the patient lay down flat on his back. And you see a big difference when, you, then, when you're sitting up. Okay, so let's go down to the tongue base area. So you can see it's very much more narrow now. And this is the epiglottis. Now I'm going to have them thrust the jaw forward. And this is what a normal airway should look like. And most people don't have this anymore. Yeah, and this is what jaw surgery does. This is what the advancement devices do. Um, and some people know just to tilt the head back or to move the jaw forward when they, when they, when they can't breathe. Subconsciously, they just, they just know. Now, this is um, another unusual situation, but I think it happens more often than you think. I call it expiratory palatal obstruction. It means that normally when you breathe in and out through your nose, the soft palate should stay open. But some people, in some people, the palate backs up like a valve as you're breathing out through your nose. So we're looking from the nose looking down. That's a u uvula and soft palate. Okay, notice how as you breathe out, it backs up like a valve, right? And what I find is that this prevents people from using CPAP because they can't breathe out through the nose and air comes out through the mouth. And so what you'll see when they're sleeping is something like this. And air puffs out through the mouth. Okay. And then this is a sleep endoscopy of a, um, epiglottic obstruction. This is the, an adult, so this is a tongue here, epiglottis. And notice what happens when you breathe in. It sucks in like a suction cup. Notice how the tongue tries to move forward, but the epiglottis flops back. And that's with the jaw thrust again. Another example where I'm, I let go of the tongue, and notice how it gets more and more relaxed. The epiglottis seems to be obstructing here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to lift the jaw very carefully, very slowly, very in minimum and small amount. I want to see if the epiglottis by itself falls back, and it doesn't as she's breathing. What this means is that it's the tongue base that's pushing on the epiglottis. It's not epiglottic obstruction. And this is a pediatric epiglottic obstruction. And you'll see, when you see the video, it's, it's not, it doesn't flap back in a flat manner. It kind of curves in, curls in like this. Like a, it's called, it's called an omega-shaped epiglottis. So this is commonly picked up in infants and newborns in our field by pediatric otolaryngologists. And the general teaching is that the kids outgrow it. So as long as you're not desaturating to like 70% or having major respiratory issues, just leave it alone, have you sleep on the stomach, and you're fine. But what I'm finding is that these kids never outgrow it. It just morphs into something else much bigger and worse because they're, they're not sleeping. Now, um, a couple years ago, we did a study looking at, we did a series of, we reviewed 50 uh, kids who underwent epigallic procedures, where either trimmed it or, or stiffened it. Um, and what we found was that, contrary to this, the concerns about these procedures, we had no complications for swallowing or speaking. Um, and the results, some of the results are pretty dramatic. I mean, life-changing, <laughs> just taking care of the epigallus alone. Now, one thing that I noticed was that when I trimmed some of these epiglottic uh, cartilage, um, it, it didn't have that rigid support like you would have in the ear or the nose. It's very flimsy and thin, like tissue paper. So it's not just the positioning of the epiglottis backwards, it's all this structure. It's not forming properly. 